song from Simon. Lord, you have now set your servant free. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior. A light to enlighten the nations. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. A reading from the Gospel according to John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of, God, Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true to come to the light, so that, they may, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Our sermon today is entitled Fear by Reverend Marshall Jolie. There is no more familiar passage in all of scripture than John 3.16. It, is, it has been emblazoned on billboards and bumper stickers, sewn into throw pillows and baseball caps, and it has even appeared tattooed into the skin of more than a few actors and athletes. And yet, as far as the 16th verse of John's third chapter is, it is juxtaposed against the verses immediately preceding it, which are undoubtedly some of the most unfamiliar verses in the New Testament. Here Jesus makes reference to Moses lifting up the snake in the wilderness, which harkens back to one of the most bizarre stories in the Torah. The story in which Jesus is referring is found in a book of Numbers. Here we encounter the Hebrew people having long been liberated from the Egyptians, but still wandering in the wilderness in search of the land which has been promised. The longer they wander, the crankier they become. They take aim at God and Moses alike, crying out in petulant frustration. All told, Numbers depicts five of these so-called murmuring episodes wherein the Hebrew people grumble and complain about an assortment of perceived grievances. They don't like the food. They want more water. They're tired. They want to go back to Egypt. They're sick of camping. Picture a minivan loaded up for a road trip with a gaggle of disgruntled toddlers kicking the seats, throwing popcorn and screaming, are we there yet? And you won't be far off. Each episode follows a predictable pattern. The Hebrew people complain, God gets angry, the Hebrew people realize they've made God angry and beg Moses to intercede on their behalf. Moses does, and God calms down. Then a few chapters later, another tantrum erupts and the same pattern unfolds. Wash, rinse, repeat. Finally, their sniping reaches a boiling point. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They grumbled against Moses and God. For there is no food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. What's well, it? They say there's no food, but they don't like the food. 
so there must be food. If you listen carefully, you'll catch the level of absurdity underpinning their whining. There is no food and water, they moan in one breath, and then we detest this miserable food. They carp in the next breath. In response, God punishes them for their insolence and sedition by sending venomous snakes into the encampment. Now, at this point, some of us are thinking, well, that was a little harsh. Those snakes bit people and some folks even died. But we must leaven our reading of scripture with a bit of theological imagination. The Hebrew people were faced with a choice. On the one hand was a life-giving relationship with God that challenged everything they thought they knew about the way the world worked and pushed them to greater depths of faith and obedience. On the other hand was the monotony of slavery in Egypt, which would surely lead to death, but at least it offered some semblance of consistency and predictability along the way. Over and over again, the Hebrew people voiced their desire to go back to Egypt and pick up where they left off as slaves to Pharaoh. In one scene, they actually hatch a plan of sedition. Let us choose a cap uh, captain and go back to Egypt. At least in Egypt, they knew how the system worked. With God, there was no telling where they would be led or what they would be asked to do. So enough of this chosen people stuff. We'll take our mundane life of slavery back, thank you very much. And yet the narrative arc of the Old Testament in particular, and scripture in general, is one of a relentless and undeterred God doing whatever it takes to maintain a relationship with humankind. Even here, as the Hebrew people are hell-bent on marching back to certain death in Egypt because they feared what they did not know and couldn't predict, God is ultimately and inexorably the source of life. As the Hebrew people repent from their foolish and seditious ways, God hears their prayer once again and sets before them a wellspring of life and healing. But the way God chooses to do it is what makes this passage even stranger. God tells Moses to craft a venomous snake and put it on a pole so that those who were bitten could look at it and be healed. Moses did as he was told and crafted a venomous snake from bronze, put it on the pole and set it in the midst of the people. Whenever a snake bit someone, they looked at the bronze snake and lived. In fact, the statue worked so well, it became a kind of a cultural icon among the Hebrew people. The statue was passed from one generation to the next until centuries later, it winds up in the temple in Jerusalem. By then it had garnered both a name, Nehushtan, and a cult-like following which prompts King Hezekiah to have it destroyed. Although there is little hope that this unfamiliar and bizarre tale will make it into the Vatican Bible School curriculum anytime soon, at its heart is a universal truth. There is no venom quite so deadly as fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of the other, fear of failure, fear of death, Nothing causes spiritual and emotional paralysis more effectively than fear. It corrodes faith, cuts off our pathways for giving and receiving grace and mercy. And if it is left untreated long enough, it leads to hatred, recalcitrance, hardness of heart and soul, and leads ultimately to death. As we continue our Lenten journey, there may be no, no more important time for us to take account of the ways in which each of us are afflicted by the venom of fear. Only when Hebrew people brought that which they feared most into full view were they made whole. The same is true for us. As we come into the few, full view of the cross and the reality of death, it is only by walking headlong into death's dark shadow that we come to know the fullness of Christ's resurrected life. For indeed, God so loves the world. Amen.
Please rise in body or spirit and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. <clears throat> Offertory hymn is number 339. suffrages, that this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, we and true you, O Lord, that your holy angels may lead us in the paths of peace and goodwill, we we you, o Lord. that we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offenses, we we you, o Lord. that there may be peace to your church and to the whole world. That we may depart this life in your faith and fear, and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ. We entreat you, O Lord. That we may be bound together by your Holy Spirit in the communion of Michael and all your saints, and trusting one another and all our life to Christ. We you, O Lord. Call it for the day. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. 
evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The seasonal collect. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The College for Saturdays. O God, the source of eternal light, shed forth your unending day upon us who watch for you, that our lips may praise you, our lives may bless you, and our worship on the morrow give you glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the prayer for mission. O God and Father of all, whom the whole heavens adore, let the whole earth also worship you. All nations obey you. All tongues confess and bless you. And men and women everywhere love you and serve you in peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all lives who are closely linked with ours, especially for B, who celebrates her birthday this week. And with ours, grant all that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them to the joy of your salvation. We pray especially for Debbie and Dennis, for Don and Shirley, for Nancy, for Patricia, and for B for Father Chuck and Gail, for Shauna, Rachel, Ann, for Daniel, Tyler, Deanna, Vincent, Maria, Lucky, Kip, Martha, for Tom, Karen, Melissa, and those we might add aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in their eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy.